At 375 Desmond Avenue, in a suburb of Kingston, Jamaica, you'll find a home that looks a lot like the other homes surrounding it. This home is my paternal grandmother's house. It's not spectacular by itself, small white tropical bungalow flanked by tropical flowering. And like um, many of the other homes on the block, it features a pattern of intricate engravings on the veranda and the gates. On my most recent trip home to my grandmother's house, I noticed these engravings, which I had always taken for granted for the very first time. During that same trip, I also traveled about an hour and a half north of Kingston to my grandmother's childhood home in the country. And I found that that house too had these same engravings on the veranda and on the gates. And upon closer inspection, I realized I wasn't looking at just mere home decoration. I was looking at Ghanaian Adinkra symbols. Adinkra symbols. They originate from Ghana's Asante people. They're aphorisms. They're tied to concepts, principles. They're meant to guide. They're nonverbal communication, but a language in, of, in and of themselves. Um, the most prominent of these throughout the African diaspora is called Sankofa. Sankofa is depicted most popularly by a bird who's looking backwards, getting an egg off its back. When you put two of these birds together with their backwards facing heads facing each other, you get a beautiful heart. Now, these symbols, they're only as important as they are recognized. In order them, for them to be recognized, they have to first be perceived. And this is particularly ironic in the case of Sankofa. When translated into most simple English, Sankofa means to reach back and get it. The idea behind Sankofa is that to move forward in life, you have to sometimes go backwards and get those principles, those morals, those values that you may have forgotten along the way. Sankofa requires that you be connected, very connected and embracing of your whole identity, your history. Basically, you have to know where you come from in order to get where you're going. Now this is interesting and it poses a dilemma because while these engravings are unfeatured on many Jamaican houses throughout the island, most people don't know what they mean. They're not recognizing them. They're not even really perceiving them. Now, of course, the fact that these engravings are in the homes are very well appreciated by most Jamaicans. They have, in some ways, taken on another identity. They're part of a local Jamaican aesthetic now. They're expected to be on the homes, whether they're modern homes or ancient homes like that my grandmother grew up in. But do the symbols have any real value if they're not perceived for what they actually are? I don't know because my grandfather and my father have passed away whether they ever recognized what they were seeing when they went home and came from home as they went to and fro, not only to their houses but to their friends' houses, their relatives' homes. They weren't ignorant people. Au contraire, my father was very intelligent, educated, very well-traveled, but it wouldn't be until he was 14 years old that Jamaica gained its independence from the United Kingdom. And so you can be sure that his British school teachers were not teaching him about the valor of rebellious Asante warriors who fought off the British as they sought to protect themselves from foreign aggression, from colonialism, from oppression. And that those Ghanaians who were then packed onto slave ships, having lost the war, and then brought to Jamaica to slave for the British Empire, to create wealth for the British Empire as colonial subjects, you can be sure that he was not taught that that was important. You can be sure that as a colonial subject, he was not taught to connect to his African identity, but instead to learn how to pray that God would save the queen. And indeed, my father did. He took tea. He became the first black junior chaplain at All Souls Church in London, England. He was an avid and talented cricketer who was selected for a test cricket team. Like many Jamaicans, he wanted to look forward and he had been taught that Africa was situated firmly in the past. However, I have to credit him and my mother that I was able to recognize what I saw in my grandmother's house when I saw it. My parents were progressive, forward-thinking people. And when I was 14, they decided they would grant me some independence. And they let me go to Ghana with my high school choir. We grew up in Detroit. Detroit, much maligned in the news these days. Detroit, broke Detroit. Detroit seat of the, the America's auto industry, responsible for creating 
a very prosperous black middle and upper middle class. Detroit, radical Detroit. Detroit where Nelson Mandela came to visit and speak upon his release from prison, where Martin Luther King gave an early version of his I Have a Dream speech. Detroit, home at one point to Malcolm X. Detroit, home to unions and radical labor politics. But among the black bourgeoisie, we too had learned that Africa was in the past. We wanted to move forward. We wanted to live the American dream. And so it did not make obvious sense that you would send your child back, backwards to Ghana, when you could just go to London or Paris. But my parents knew better, and so they sent me. And I am forever grateful for that investment, because Ghana, in the most literal and symbolic of ways, gave me my future. I'll never forget when I landed. I was taken aback because Ghana looked so much like Jamaica. The architecture was the same, and I cannot tell you how many times when walking up and down the streets of Accra with my high school choir that I flipped out because I saw someone who looked just like, not similar to, just like an aunt or uncle. I remember calling home a really clunky, clunky old cell phone with credit that I had bought in a roadside shop that was decorated in the print and color of the Jamaican flag with reggae music blaring from it, mind you. Oh my God, daddy is just like Jamaica, you have to come. Sadly, he never got to come, but the investment he made in me by sending me back to Africa is evident to me. It was in Ghana that I started to wonder about history, that I started to contemplate questions of justice and resistance. I became interested in the law, and it is because of that I attribute that trip almost entirely to the fact that I'm a human rights lawyer today. Now, I love what I do. I study specifically the development of human rights in regimes, specifically in the Pan-African world, but also in the United States, both global southern and industrialized countries. And what I do is very complicated, but not because it's so hard to write a paper or a study on human rights or develop human rights cases, but because human rights are so misunderstood in the United States and black histories so misremembered. Even talented attorneys ask me, Marissa, what are human rights? What's the big deal about human rights? Why are they so special? But most importantly, how are they different from civil rights? And so I tell them, well, civil rights are human rights. Human rights are a global canon of law. It's universal law. On the one hand, you have civil and political human rights, those rights that are tied to you, your, your identity as a citizen of a state. And then on the other hand, you have social and economic human rights, things like the right to food and health and education. Now, in the United States, we embrace all of those, but we have a markedly more warm relationship with civil and political rights, like the right to free speech and freedom of assembly and religion, than we do with the idea that all children have the right to recess or the idea that you all necessarily have the right to a job or food. And there's history behind that. In fact, what we know as the Southern Civil Rights Movement originated as an international human rights movement, led by the NAACP and other civil rights icons like Mary McLeod Bethune in the 1940s through the 1950s, as documented by Emory historian Carol Anderson, these activists petitioned the United Nations on behalf of African American citizens who were being terrorized by the threat of lynching, who could not vote, and who dealt with segregation in the Deep South. What they did was radical, not just because they aired the United States' dirty laundry before the World Court, but because they also made demands in terms of social and economic justice. They realized that just as Black American citizens, along with all citizens, had the right to not have their lives snatched up by being strung up on a tree. They also knew that if you could not feed your family, the same result, death, would await. Now this was happening as the Cold War was very much heating up. And this posed, proposed, this posed the problem to legislators who were invested in maintaining Jim Crow. Because on the one hand, the Soviet Union was pointing to American racism as a moral failing on the US's part. And on the other hand, internally, these activists, these agitators who were speaking about human rights explicitly in human rights terms were threatening the social and economic order that slavery had instituted and that segregation maintained. And so they used the Cold War to their advantage. They associated the human rights activists with communism. And in doing so, they were able to delegitimize them. 
And now the activists had a problem. They could either continue fighting for social economic human rights alongside civil rights and face the criminal pe penalties that came along with being associated as a traitor or as a communist person, or they could drop the latter from the agenda. They chose the latter. And so with a narrow focus on civil and political human rights, the civil rights movement was born. Now civil rights are not a problem. No, I'm saying that civil rights are exactly half the solution. What is problematic is that in the United States now, civil and political human rights by themselves and to the exclusion of social economic human rights have become our entire paradigm for justice and freedom and progress. I think Malcolm X put it best. In his 1964 Ballad or the Bullet speech, he said, you spend so much time barking up the civil rights tree, you don't notice the human rights tree planted next door. And this is difficult for me as a human rights lawyer because human rights has taught me that all human rights are universal and interrelated and indivisible. You cannot have one without the other. They are not meant to work in isolation or in competition with each other. They are meant to work in cooperation with each other. And so while we focus on civil and political co-rights exclusively, many Americans wallow in poverty, they send their children to underperforming schools, and they die early of preventable diseases and conditions. Civil, civil and political rights alone were never meant to cure these ills. They cannot. And so like a responsible attorney, I want my clients to not be cheated out of half of their inheritance. And I would argue that that is what is happening to us. As a human rights lawyer, everybody is my client. And so how do I get my clients their full inheritance? Well, first I have to start by making sure that we recognize what it is we stand to inherit. What it is that the people who came before us and behind us lived and loved and fought and bled and died and gave of their lives and their careers so that we could host, hoist ourselves on their shoulders and move forward. So that's what Sankofa means to me. Sankofa means that I am in, in service to all Americans, help us reclaim the rich human rights history that we left behind, that we failed to remember and articulate, and that we move forward towards new structures, new linguistic structures and paradigms that talk about human rights as human rights, and that we progress. Now, we're not all human rights lawyers, but we're all valuable human beings with stories, histories, purposes, and goals, and voices. We know that if we do not tell our stories, that someone else will tell them for us, and they may leave something out or add something in that we don't want. And that stories, when told, have power, that they become histories, whether accurate or inaccurate. So I want to encourage us all to go in search of Sankofa and find out more about ourselves, not just as individuals, but as communities and as nations. And when we do that, when we have the information that allows us to know what we know, to see exactly what we see when we're seeing it, and to know what we're hearing when we hear it, we will be empowered and the possibilities will be endless. And we deserve all of those possibilities. <laughs>